How you doing today? IB Nation Sports Talk up and rolling. I'm Sean Styers. I won't be doing this whole show alone today. I'll be joined by two different people spaced apart. Ryan Roberts going to join me first. We're going to talk a little uh, superlatives from the pot of gold recruiting extravaganza on Sunday. And then after that, Vince D'Addario is going to join me and uh, we are going to do a little bit of rapid fire. Regulars of the show know that Tuesday is typically a Jesse day on the show. Today is his birthday. And on this date, 28 years ago today, his mother and I were, were waiting and pacing the hallways of Lawrence Memorial Hospital in Lawrence, Kansas uh, for his birth. I was uh, at work at a radio station getting ready to do a little news in the morning when I got a call at 5.30 a.m., that uh, it was time, well, it wasn't quite time. It took around 14 hours or so, 13, 14 hours, I think, before uh, Mr. Stubborn finally popped out. So happy birthday, Jesse. He'll be along later in the week. But for now, Vince will be in in a little bit with rapid fire. And then uh, before that, well, our guy, Ryan Roberts, right now. All right, so here he is. Ryan Roberts, I set all this up. So, you know, like nothing annoys me more than when I listen to a podcast when they do like the cold, you know, open and then they run through everything that they're going to talk about and then they bring the person on and then they run through, you know, like everything again. So I probably just, you know, did what annoys me. So <laughs> I, I, I'm actually very guilty of that, Sean. When we have uh, when we have players on the NFL draft podcast. Usually we have obviously the intro that's built in and then it goes into and I actually right. do another intro. You know what exactly. I mean? Exactly. Like, exactly. Reset welcome back. You don't even need to hear this again. 30 yeah, seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Forward. <laughs> All right. So pot of gold. Um yes. seems like it was a pretty big success just based on everything that I've heard so far. But let's jump into it here a little bit. Ryan, you know, the big announcement yesterday, I think, was the commitment of Jordan Faison's brother, Dylan. So how did this all come about? It was a wild situation, Sean. So quick story for everyone who didn't see the podcast on, on Monday. So we did our Pot of Gold recap. I actually had Dylan Faison come on, okay, on the show. He was live on the show with us, and I had very little idea that he had committed to Notre Dame already. Like he was literally verbally committed to Notre Dame, silently committed while he was on the show. And then on the show, he said something like, he said something like, Oh, it, it, you know, talking about talking to Jordan about the challenges of Notre Dame. And, and Jordan was basically like, after he had offered, you know, telling him like, Hey, don't feel pressure to go to Notre Dame. If you don't want to go to Notre Dame, that type of thing. And he was like, well, Notre Dame had been my dream way before Jordan had ever you know even thought about Notre Dame right like since I was a little kid right and he's talking about it, he's like no I want this challenge like this is why I'm going to do this I'm going to do this I'm like wait did you just commit on the show like I'm not <laughs> right. right now right and uh so I texted him right after that every other of the show I was like hey man are, are are you committing today like are you committing he's like yeah I'm committing today at like I think it was like 4 15 eastern time he's like don't tell it don't put it on twitter I'm like well I wanted to be like well I think it kind of told everybody when don't I put twitter. it on twitter but you just broadcast it to the world uh, live on my oh. show <laughs> Sean it was wild man it was one of the more interesting situations on a day that a player committed but I mean how did it happen I honestly didn't even know much about Dylan face on until about a week before pot of gold when he had gotten a heads up about obviously a lot of the players that were gonna get offered and mm -hmm. saw his name on the list and saw that he was from florida and i'm like well that's interesting that a face on is from florida right so you start doing your your digging and of course lacrosse comes up and football comes up and you start to really pace the picture and then you find you know the parents names and everything you're like oh mm -hmm. that's his that's his brother okay got it so well i mean we being knew, a sophomore being a 2026 guy like he's He's fairly far off the radar right now, yeah. right? Like, not to cut he, you off, but I mean, like, that's not quite on the radar yet for most people. It's not at all, no. And he actually, it was actually his first pure offer as a just a football player so far. Mm -hmm. So Notre Dame was his first offer. He is also, for people that don't follow lacrosse too much, 
He's rated by one of the major platforms as the number one lacrosse player in the 2026 recruiting class as well. So yeah. he's not only a big time receiver because he averaged like 27 yards a catch as a sophomore at St. Andrews in Florida. Like he's a very good wide receiver, but then also dynamic lacrosse player. I mean, if you go on his huddle highlight tape, you're going to see like four goals, five goals, seven goals, six goals, seven goals, like every single game, man. And like, it's absolutely wild. So he obviously knows about the program very well. He's had the chance to be on the, on, on the campus. I mean, he he's like a legit lacrosse guy too, Sean. Like I, I apparently New York is like the place to be for lacrosse. So like in the summers, he goes up to New York to train just okay. for lacrosse for the summers, basically. So he will be doing both football and lacrosse at Notre Dame. Very talented player. Notre Dame, uh, he, when we sent, got sent the list, obviously got a little bit of feedback, and he was a player that Notre Dame wanted very very much, right? So this wasn't like a walk-on situation. Yeah, They wanted Dylan Face on a part of the program. And the minute he got the, the offer, pretty much, it was, it was a done deal. I mean, literally offered officially on Sunday during Pot of Gold, committed on Monday. Wow. Very crazy times, to say the least. But I mean, imagine it's just like you said, he's got a brother who's going through it here in terms of the two sports. So he he knows firsthand, he's got information firsthand about just how Marcus Freeman and his staff are going to handle it. And obviously how Kevin Corrigan and the lacrosse staff are going to handle it. So that's exactly that's got to help quite a bit for him just just to have that firsthand information. Well, we asked him about that on the podcast and he had said that, you know, basically he wants to try to emulate exactly what Jordan's been able to do early in his career, just from the functionality of being able to juggle those things. Cause it's not easy. I mean, being a student at Notre Dame is hard enough. Being a dual sport athlete at Notre Dame is incredibly difficult, but obviously Jordan has been thriving. I mean, at the end of the season this past year, Jordan was probably the best receiver on Notre Dame's team, you know, arguably, and he has been a absolute sensation so far on the lacrosse field as well. So, Great mentor, great person to emulate. And I think that obviously Notre Dame really liked Dylan Faison, and he is the first commit in 2026, which is absolutely wild to think about, man. Absolutely wild. <laughs> People, were we, were we, wasn't I on the show last week where there was literally a person that asked, when is usually the first commitment that happens? And I'm like, hey, Blue and Gold Games usually kind of like the marker for like a first commit in the class. And here we are, day after a pot of gold, and we have a kid in the 2026 class committed, Boom. which is pretty crazy to think about. Yeah, no doubt. All right, so a long list of offers that obviously went out on Pot of Gold Day. Who's who's kind of the cream of the crop? Who's up at the top of the list in your eyes? There are a couple of elite players in this class that I've seen so far, and it, obviously it's not everyone, but I would say that there are four players that I looked at right now, Sean, and I'm like, that's a kid, that kid is a slam dunk five star today. Like I don't need to see any more of him. Like unless he just falls off a cliff the last two years, you know. I guess that stuff always happens, but like. Just absolutely freak shows. So one is Jared Curtis, who's a quarterback out of Tennessee. He's on Notre Dame's <laughs> radar, a kid that Notre Dame likes very much. I don't think that it's a reasonable option for Notre Dame to be in that one, though. I mean, that kid's that kid's probably going to go to Alabama or Georgia more than anything. But this kid is 6'3", 215 pounds. I remember texting Brian Driscoll about him. Like, that's Matt Stafford all over again. Like, he looks just like Matt Stafford on the field, man. It's wow. pretty wild. His arm is live. For a, like, if you would have told me that he was a senior on his last year's film, I would have 100% believed you. Like, his arm is absolutely live. So, he's one. I would say Kendra Harrison, who's a tight end out of Reedsville, North Carolina. <laughs> Sean, this, this stuff makes me laugh every single year, man. He's a sophomore that is a six foot seven. 235 pound tight end that can also play defensive end if he wanted to. I mean, almost had a thousand yards last year for Reedsville. Can had over why. 10 tackles for loss. <laughs> I mean, he had like 18 tackles for loss, 10 sacks. He could literally play tight end, defensive end, or wide receiver on the end of, on the college level on a very high level, too. I'm not saying like, oh, yeah, he can pass. Like, he can be a legitimate dude at either one of those positions. Probably the best player, though, I've seen is this guy. His name is Jackson Cantwell. He's out of Nixon, Missouri. He's an offensive tackle. Six, seven and a half, 300 pounds as a sophomore. And there's like no bad weight on him. I saw him. I'm just like, geez, dude, like you can play college football right now. Like no exaggeration. I know Notre Dame is, is pressing for him right now because obviously Notre Dame is one of the best offensive line developers in all of college football. And he is the number one offensive lineman in 2026. And I mean, he's a big time dude, man. I mean, he moves well, he's physical, he's long. Like there's just. There's really no hole in that kid's game. He's going to be an absolute stud of a player. And the last one who's a player that actually 
wasn't a pot of gold player for Notre Dame. It's been a guy that's had an offer for a couple months already, and that's Anthony Jones out of the state of Alabama. He plays off-ball linebacker. He plays on-ball. Notre Dame offered him as a Viper. He's like 6'4", 214, 215 pounds right now. The kid is just a freaky athlete, man. Like He moves incredibly well out in space. He can rush the passer. Those are probably the four kids that if you ask me, like, who are the most impressive players I've seen so far? It would be Jackson Cantwell. It would be Anthony Jones. It would be Kendrick Harrison. And it would be Jared Curtis, the quarterback out of Tennessee. Are there rules on, you know, we talk about players and reclassification and all that kind of stuff. But like you were saying, you know, this is a sophomore who could play college right now. Like if he could, if he could get his high school credits done after his sophomore season, him or anyone, you know, (laughs) like. Could a guy could a guy go to college that early, regardless of age? Like, are there any rules that you know of around that? And I I think there's very few players that would even be able to think about that. I mean, that that's like a generational player, in my opinion, right? right. A kid that's right. like just it, that advanced as a 16 year old that he could literally go play college football. But I mean, we've seen it. I remember uh, you remember Amobi Okoye who played defensive tackle for mm-hmm. Louisville and then was drafted in the first round. He was a 16 year old freshman, so okay. like he went he went to Louisville and he was playing as a 16 year old. Romeo Quara was like 17 when he was a true freshman at Notre Dame. So like we've seen some younger guys do it. Yeah. Jackson Cantwell's one where like he could a hundred percent go into an, a college locker room today and not look out of place, right? Like he would not look out of place at all. So, I mean, yeah, if he, if he was, as if he could somehow make, make up two, you know, two levels, uh, two years of, of credits in a very short amount of time, could he go to Notre Dame's locker room next year and not look out of place? Absolutely. He could 100% do that. I, I don't think that's wise or reasonable for an offensive lineman, but he's one of those yeah. kids that I looked at. He is, in my opinion, the best player in this class. Like I watched him. I'm just like, that is the best high school sophomore I've ever seen. I mean, he is just impressive. So yeah, he could definitely just get dropped in the college locker room and you'd be like, yeah, he doesn't look out of place. He looks like he belongs here. <laughs> So we talked last week about sort of locking down the guys in the backyard, Chicago oh, yeah. area, Indiana, that kind of thing. And uh, there were there were five different offers, I think, that that went out from this area. What 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 are those guys yeah. looking like? Yeah. So only five offers from Indiana in the state of Illinois, specifically the two players that were offered from Illinois or Chicago based kids, right? So just to be a little bit more specific there. Okay. Funny, and me and Sean were t- Sean Davis were talking about this on yesterday's show. Four out of five of the players that were offered, Sean, were all defensive linemen, which is just very interesting, right? Like clearly there's a a type that you're that you're kind of looking at. Because I mean, you even think back to the 2025 class that's still getting filled up, but Notre Dame has three defensive linemen from their backyard that are committed in the class in Christopher Burgess and Joseph Reef and Dominic Kulak's more of a He's more of a kind of a hybrid linebacker edge type of dude. But like l- literally you got three front seven players from the state of Illinois just in the 2025 class. And although the volume isn't as good in 2026, there's not as many great players in Illinois, it looks like this year, and not, not as many in Indiana. You still have four quality defensive linemen that I think Notre Dame is going to push for heavily. You know, so we'll see what the combination ends up looking like. But they offer Braden Jones out of Mount Carmel. They offer J.J. Finch, who's out of Warren Central, who is the same school that that they're recruiting, you know, their top pass rusher right now in 2025 that they're really looking at. They also have two defensive linemen in Illinois, Mikhail Blade and Gabe Hill. So Notre Dame is is clearly finding a type in Illinois, I think, over the last two years, like finding those defensive line, which makes sense because, like, if I issue, like, tell me something about Chicago, right, just like a general sports thing, basketball is something that comes up pretty quick, right? Like, oh, a lot of good basketball players come out of, Chicago. We literally have a kid in 2025 and Christopher Burgess that goes to Simeon that it's like, that's a pretty prestigious basketball school. You know, some good players that come out of there. So I think it makes sense that Illinois specifically, Chicago specifically are putting out a lot of defensive linemen that Notre Dame has interest in. Because when I think of basketball players, I think of long explosive athletes, right? And I think that's what Notre Dame needs more of is they need long explosive athletes up front. And I think that locking down a couple of those premier defensive linemen that are right in their backyard, that again, being Mikhail Blade, being Gabe Hill, being J.J. Finch, and being, uh, missing one, Braden Jones, that, that I think that's paramount in this year's class. Not as many players, but I think that the 
the players you have are very important for 2026. Interesting. Okay. All right. Quarterbacks. Predominantly, Quarterback. I think California and Florida yep. were, you yes. know, kind of where the offers went. Who's maybe the most likely to commit to Notre Dame? It's a really funny quarterback here, man, because right now all offers that have been gone out because there was six quarterbacks that were technically offered in pot of gold, but there's seven quarterbacks that are on the board and one that was previously offered. And three of them are from the state of Florida, that being Noah Grubbs, that being Brady Hart, that being Will Griffin. And then you have three from the state of California, that being Brady Smigel, that being Ryder Lyons, and then Tro Troy Hume is the other quarterback out of the state of California. So you have three in California, three in Florida, and then we already talked about Jared Curtis. That's a Tennessee kid, right? But but Gino Gadulli has been on the road a ton during the open period, and he has found those players, right? He went out to see Troy Hume. He's went out to see Brady Smigel. He went out to see Ryder Lyons. He's been down to see Brady Hart. Like, he's been around, and those are the guys that he is really focusing on. And Right now, I would say of the most the most likely options, in my opinion, of a board would look something like this. No particular order. Ryder Lyons out of Folsom in the state of California. I would say Noah Grubbs, who's out of the state of Florida. And then I would say Brady Hart, quarterback out of, uh, quarterback out of Coco in the state of Florida as well. Like Those are the three most likely today. They're obviously going to keep recruiting other guys, but we have Two of those guys are going to be coming up to visits this offseason already. Noah Grubbs is going to be back for his third visit this uh, overall to Notre Dame this offseason. Brady Hart is going to be making his first trip up to South Bend. Ryder Lyons is talking about taking a trip uh, at some point in the summer, but has not solidified a time yet. So if you ask me who are the most likely, I would say the two guys that stand out out of that three-man group, I think Ryder Lyons is a guy that Notre Dame is very high on. I think that Brady Hart is another guy that Notre Dame is very high on, and he reciprocates that interest. So – Who's going to commit first is at the end of the day, right? I think that Notre Dame, in my opinion, I think Notre Dame would take commitments from any of that top group that I just mentioned, including Noah Grubbs. The question is who wants that spot most and who's able to make the plunge quickest. And I think that Notre Dame would be very happy with either of those three. They'd be happy with Jared Curtis as well, if Jared Curtis wanted to come, right? But I just don't think Jared Curtis is in a decision-making mode, one, and I don't think that he's, he would pick Notre Dame if he was. So ultimately those three men, Brady Hart and Ryder Lyons, I think are the two most likely as of today. And you think maybe the quarterbacks, like, are we thinking maybe sometime within the next month or so or kind of yep. a kind of a longer play? No, I, I think it's going to come off. I, I think it's going to come off this 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 offseason, this okay. summer, I think is when it's going to happen. So you have the two quarterbacks that I mentioned that are going to take visits. If neither one of them pop at some point after their visit, then Ryder Lions will be coming up as well. I do think before the the season kicks off for 2024, I think Notre Dame will know who their 2026 quarterback is. I think that we'll have a pretty decent understanding there of where things stands because again, it's a and they know it's a race, Sean. Like funny enough, Noah Grubbs and Brady Hartz, they are actually trained together. They go to the same trainer, uh um, Trujillo, I forget his first name, uh, Balin. Balin Trujillo is their quarterback coach, private quarterback coach. And they so they train together. And Noah Grubbs literally said this to me in an interview like two weeks ago where he was like, I know Notre Dame really likes Brady, who I train with as well. So we'll see what happens with that spot, right? So like they know that that spot, there's only one, obviously in every quarter, every class for the most part, especially for a Notre Dame. So if they want to be that guy, they're going to have to make a decision sometime relatively soon, man, or else that spot might not be open for very long. All right. What about tight ends? Hearing good things about uh, 2026 tight ends. Any guys to uh, to kind of know from that group? This is probably the highest quality position compared to how many are on the board. It's pretty wild. To look. I mean, because I already mentioned Kendra Harrison, who I think is a five-star tight end out of the state of North Carolina. Like, he's fantastic. But so they only offered five tight ends in this class. I just held up four fingers for so, some stupid reason, but I meant to hold <laughs> five fingers up, okay? So they, they, they offered five tight ends, Sean. Kendra Harrison talked about a ton, five-star out of North Carolina. Brock Harris out of Utah, who Pine, um, Pine View High School out of Utah. He is six foot five, 230 pounds, very talented player, rated as a top 35-ish player by multiple platforms. He's incredibly talented. Caden Prothrow out of Georgia, who is – 6'6", 
I'll say tentatively 210 pounds. I think he might be a little bit skinnier than that right now. He's a he's much more boundary receiver than he is tight end right now. But that dude can run. Like he's incredibly talented. And then they have a kid that's in their backyard as well. I mentioned there was five guys from Illinois, Indiana. The other guy is J.C. Anderson, who's an Illinois kid out of Mount Zion. He's a pretty talented kid himself. Six seven, 230 pounds. And then the most hilarious watch of any player I've had so far is this kid named Hezzy Kent, and I, I might be pronouncing his first name wrong. It's H-E-Z-E. I'm going to say it's Hezzy. He is 6'5", 250, and if you would have told me that he was 265, I would have been like, I believe you, man. I I, <laughs> I, I see that. Sean, it's hilarious. He lines up at, at Wildcat quarterback. He just runs quarterback power all the time and stuff, and they use him after catches the tight end. He's just a monster. Like He just gets downhill and breaks tackles. Hilarious watch. Absolutely hilarious. But with Kendra Harrison and Brock Harris up top, with the depth of guys like J.C. Harrison and the pro throw kid out of Georgia. Just, although it's only five players, that is a hilariously good <laughs> tight end crop that Notre Dame has offered so far. Like, just insane talent out of those five kids. All right, Ryan. I've got Vince yeah. coming on for rapid fire here in a minute. I'm going to I'm gonna do like a pre-rapid fire, pot of gold rapid fire with you. How about that? We'll kind of, we'll finish this with a little bit of a flurry. What do you think? Let's do it. Let's do okay. it, man. Let's do so, it. So, yeah. your favorite... Pot of gold player is blank. Oh, man, that's that's actually a really difficult one. I think that uh, Jackson Cantwell is a kid that I just talked about in nauseam on the show already. I talked about him yesterday and Monday. It's hilarious. I think the other one, though, that's probably my favorite one in sense of like a really cool back story is there's a defensive end named Ronnie Rodney Dunham who plays in the state of North Carolina. He's like 6'4", 215-pound defensive lineman, plays on the edge a ton, but he might have a body that's a big end eventually, like he might be 250-something pounds pretty quickly. But he is also one of the top baseball players in the state of North Carolina in 2026. Sean, a 6'4", 250-pound defensive end that goes on the mountains and throws 90-plus miles an hour, man. How could you not love that, right? So Rodney Dunham, I think, is one of my favorite ones because it's just such a – like you, you see like, oh, maybe a defensive end like a – great power hitter and like a you know maybe corner outfielder like that type of thing you don't see too many guys that are also pitchers and 90 plus mile per hour on the mound as well so no he's a very interesting player very interesting okay most impressive athlete is blank oh it's got to be anthony jones the kid out of alabama the edge linebacker i mean he's he's one of those actually i, I lied i changed my answer i changed my answer <laughs> on the fly here he's up there but it's Ken Jerry Harrison, the tight end out of North Carolina. I mean, you just don't see guys that are 6'7", 235, and could play wide receiver, tight end, defensive end, and probably off-ball linebacker if you felt like it, right? Like, he is just a freak show athlete. And when you ask me, like, most impressive athlete, versatility is, like, one thing that pops in my head pretty quickly because it's like, if you're able to play so many different positions, that means that you're very athletic, right? Like, you wouldn't be able to do that without that type of athleticism. That kid is just – because, like, it's not just – He's tall and he's able to win jump balls. He's running after the catch. He's been timed in the four sixes in the 40 at six, seven, 235 pounds. He rushes the passer. He sets the edge. Kendra Harrison's a freak show out of North Carolina. All right. Last question. The yes. guy with the most upside is blank. Ooh. All right. So I'm going to go a little bit off the rails here. This one, this one's a little bit different. So I'm going to pick Kevin Brown, who's an offensive tackle out of Pennsylvania. Okay. So he is a very intriguing player because right now he is all of six, five and 260 pounds. So he is a very skinny player, but if you look at him on film or just look at pictures of him, this kid has zero fat on him, Sean, like he's 260 pounds and it looks like he has a six pack. Like it is gross. Like it's absolutely <laughs> gross. Cause I'm looking at him. I'm like, that kid's going to be well over 300 pounds. Like he, his body type looks like Joe Thomas now, right? After Joe Thomas lost all his weight after his playing career, he is going to be a really big kid, but he's also a very good all state wrestler. Very good. He's got hands. He's got physicality. He has incredible movement skills. I mean, right now on film, he looks more like a big tight end than he does a true offensive tackle. I think when his body develops and his athleticism just takes a next jump with a little bit more just power and, and overall in his core and his lower body, that kid could be a big-time offensive lineman on next level. So give me Kevin Jones, who's an offensive tackle out of Harrisburg in Pennsylvania. Great stuff. There's so much content that you've got from Pot of Gold up on irishbreakdown.com right now. I'm still trying to catch up with all of well, it. So. Well, luckily for you, Sean, I still have like 10 more interviews that I have to write up. So Lovely. We'll, uh, we'll get there eventually, man. We'll <laughs> Looking there. forward to it. All right. 
Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate it. I will talk to you again soon. Thank you, sir. Front end of the double dip. I accidentally muted myself on the switch there with Ryan Roberts talking a little pot of gold. And now it is Vince D'Addario. I just have to say it out of formality. Are you ready for rapid fire? Oh, I've been waiting. I, it's very strange when you know you're going to be on the show and it like hits six o'clock. Like my, <laughs> my kids were like, Dad, it's six o'clock. What are you doing? It's like, I got time. I got time today. Is this the first time you've done like the split show? Yes. And it's very weird. <laughs> very weird for me. It is a little different. It's a little different yeah. for me as well. Just from a preparation standpoint, it's a lot right. different. You know? Yeah, for sure. For sure. But hey, got a lot more uh, recruiting stuff on the show these days with Ryan. Which is awesome, especially yeah. with the pot of gold going out, which I think is obviously yeah. an awesome situation um, that that Notre Dame does every uh, St. Patrick's Day. And I always forget about it until St. Patrick's Day rolls around. And it's like, oh, that's the pot of gold day. Right. That's the pot of gold day. <laughs> so yeah, it's always uh, it's always super exciting to watch those roll in and, you know, all that stuff. So uh Fun, very, very much fun, and it's always nice to see how Notre Dame kind of ups the game every year. And uh, I kind of liked the Indiana Jones theme. I'm not gonna lie; these kids probably have no idea who Indiana Jones is uh, that are getting these offers. But I noticed, and that's all that matters. Well, there was a new, the, the, you know, I, I don't know that the Indi the latest Indiana Jones movie was that great based on what I heard. I didn't go see. It. I it saw was, it. It, it was, was better than it was better than the Crystal Skull one. Much okay. better. Okay. So it was good. It was good. Okay. I enjoyed it. All right. Well, let's just talk some football. What do you okay. think? Well, before we do, can we talk about our bracket challenge real quick? In case let's do it. Did Remind people. Info. Yes. Um, we are running an IB Nation Sports Talk bracket challenge. So if you want to be a part of it, you, all you got to do is go to ESPN, either log in or create a profile. Then go to the bracket challenge, uh, and I think they call it tournament challenge. And you hit groups, and you type in Ivy Nation Sports Talk. You'll see our group come up, and then the password is Irish Breakdown. One word, two capital letters. Easy. Easy. And there's one for men, and there's one for women. We currently have dun, 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 57 people on the men's side. Okay. And 10 on the women's side. All right. So need to step it up on the on the women's side. Men's side should be a lot of fun though. I told Jesse to get in, get his get his brackets in, but he's doing birthday stuff today. So wow, still yeah. They, well, oh, they were yeah. good. Well, today is his birthday, but this is true. You know, like he got this to stretch it for a few days because of the yeah, fact he that did. he came into town last weekend. So this today is, is the actual birthday. This is true. Yeah. So he's but, not in uh, there yet, and no. that means it will be up to eleven. Which would be I feel like story. mine are a little chalky in both. You know, well, I was a little disappointed when I sat back and looked at them. But but for for women though, a lot of times that's kind of how it rolls. You know what it I does. mean? Like it's it it's very chalky. And I would say that the I was talking to the women's basketball or the girls, I guess, girls basketball coach at Penn, and uh, she was like, "Yeah, you know, the chasm used to be a lot bigger between like the top teams and the bottom teams." Mm -hmm. He's like, "That it's definitely closing," but you still see a lot of chalk, especially early on. Yeah. LSU. LSU was a three seed last year. They won the national championship. I believe that's true. They're the lowest seed ever to win a championship, or at least in recent years, they're the lowest seed. too. So it still does tend to go a lot more chalky with the women. Although I do right. feel like, I feel like it's very top heavy with South Carolina, obviously. And then you can probably put, I still put Iowa right sure. after them, but I feel like there's a lot of parity. Otherwise, I think I, you know it's going to be a very competitive tournament. I think it's, maybe it should be a lot of fun. Other than yeah. the very top, so yeah, it should be a lot of fun. But uh, first prize for both the men's and women's bracket challenges, you get to spend a day cutting coupons with Vince D'Addario. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, the fun we will have! Yes, <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're, yeah, we're going to get the store cool. to pay us to take the food out. That's how we roll. That's right. That's yeah. exactly right. <laughs> what about the Burger King coupon? Is it good? Is it bad? How long does it last? <laughs> hey, you want to know what we did between school and the show? Sean Styers, <laughs> Burger King. <laughs> it's free. It's free cone day at Dairy Queen. There you go. That's the way to do it, especially it, when you got kids. I don't blame walk, you. Walked up to the counter. Six cones, please. 
because Dylan wasn't around. That's right. Today's the equinox, isn't it? First yeah. day of uh, first day of spring yep. officially. Yep. Jesse was telling me the same thing. He was going to stop by and get a free cone at, at DQ in Cleveland. So it was a heck of a line, but we uh, muscled our way through it because we like free. Yep. All right. Well, let's get into some rapid fire. Benjamin okay. Morrison had six interceptions two years ago. Xavier Watts had seven interceptions last season. Which of those two will have more interceptions this season, 2024? This is a really, really good question. And I think at the end of the day, you know, if we go in, if we're going into, you know, the 25 NFL draft, I think, you know, Benjamin Morrison, I think is going to, is going to be drafted higher. I think he's the better overall player, sure. even though Xavier Watts was the defensive player of the year. Right. Uh, but I, I still think it's harder to throw away from a safety than it is a corner. Tend to agree. And so I'm going to go with Xavier Watts. I think he is, he has, you know, last year was obviously his coming out party, you know, playing safety and doing everything that he was doing. He has got this thing down to a science. He's going to be all over the field. I think he's going to be able to make some quarterbacks, make some decisions that they're not going to want to make. And so he might dupe some people into it. It's easy to, not easy. It's easier to go away from a corner. And I think a lot of teams yes. are going to try to fire at, the first year starter, whether yep. it's you know Christian Gray, Jaden Mickey, whoever's on the other side, it's going to be easier to go that way. But then Xavier Watts is going to be right there, man. So um, I, I'm excited about it. I'm very excited about both of them because I think they can shut down half the field, frankly, for sure, and force teams to go the other way. Yeah, no, and you're exactly right. You know, a couple times Xavier Watts was right place, right time, but that happens for safeties if you're if you're playing where you're supposed to be and you're just yep. in position making your reads properly you're you're going to find yourself in the right place i've said before used to say it you know back in in the coaching days preparation breeds luck basically you know like people want to talk about oh you got lucky or he got lucky or whatever well if you're prepared more times than not the luck is going to break your way just based on the fact that you know what's going to happen inside and out. I do find it interesting that in both of these cases, two years ago for Morrison and last year for Watts, the interceptions really came in bunches for both. Yeah. Like they were clustered for five of the six that Morrison had in his big interception season in 2022 came in a stretch of three games with, you know, three against Boston College, two against Clemson. And then six of Watts, seven interceptions came in a five game stretch <laughs> last year, you know, so like Again, they came in bunches, but I completely agree with your line of thinking. It is much easier to avoid a cornerback than it is a safety. And when you got a safety who became the ball hawk that Xavier right. Watts was last right. year, I think he becomes more difficult to defend as well, especially when you are going to have at least one great corner out there on the field and you've got you know, budding greatness on the other side, depending on how those guys play, Gray and, and Mickey. Sure. Well, and a lot of guys, a lot of people are saying, you know, Christian Gray is going to end up with more than both of them, which is a definite possibility he because he he's going to be tested if yeah. he ends up being the starter. I mean, both guys are going to play, obviously, between him and Jaden Mickey. But, you know, he's going to get tested because he's the unknown. And I have a feeling he is going to be known uh, sooner than later. But they got to throw the ball somewhere. So, you know... Either way, they're they're going to throw it underneath, and you know, look, it's going to be a no fly zone no matter where they throw the ball in the secondary. But it's going to be fun to watch. I think there's going to be a lot of picks going on. Yes, got some a, a couple questions popping up about the brackets. We'll address that when, once we get through. <laughs> of we do rapid fire. How about that? We'll right. we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll we'll circle back and we'll address all the different bracket questions at the end. So some big news out of Clemson and the ACC today. Yeah. Clemson yeah. has filed a lawsuit against the ACC over the conference's media rights, their grant of rights, saying the withdrawal penalty that the ACC has in place, where you have to pay all this money, not just for breaking the contract, but for remaining years that are left on the contract, quote, will, will have a, quote, chilling effect on Clemson's ability to explore and pursue an exit from the ACC. End quote. So among the things Clemson wants the court to rule in its favor, 
that the ACC does not own the broadcasting rights to its games after it leaves the league and that Clemson should not be required to pay the exit fee. Now, they also kind of included some stuff about Notre Dame in there as well, which I'll get to here yeah, they really? in a second. I'll, I'll see if I can find that here real quickly. But what do you think of, of this lawsuit, Vince, just this whole thing? I think it sounds very childish, to be honest with you. Like, you signed up for this. Nobody held a gun to your head and said, you need to sign this. When they sign this, they're like, man, we're going to be in the money. This is fantastic. This is great. It's long term. So that means that, yeah. you know, we're going to have financial stability for, you know, the foreseeable future. And now they want out of it. And it's ridiculous. Like, this is what you signed up for. That's right. I'm sorry. I, I don't have any sympathy for Florida State for Clemson or anybody else that wants to get out of it. You signed on the dotted line. That's on you, man. I, you knew what the exit fee was going to be. You knew. And, you know, people kind of want to take shots at the ACC for the fact that they're getting, you know, that, they're, that their TV revenue is so much lower, obviously, especially than the SEC in the Big Ten. But remember, this contract came a few years before either the Big Ten or the SEC got these big right. mega deals. And the ACC went to, you know, the, the presidents and, you know, the, all the schools. And they're like, here's what it's going to be. It, you know, it's going to, I think it was a 15-year deal when they signed this thing. That again, just to remind everybody, runs through 2036. You know, it's it's 15-year deal. This is what the revenue was going to be. And everybody was like, sign me up. They yeah. all wanted it. They thought it was great at the time. And Give it to the ACC, actually, for having the foresight to include the language because basically the ACC is still intact while the Pac-12 is floating in the Pacific Ocean because of the fact that they had this stipulation in their contract. That there Ironclad. Was going to be, yeah, that's exactly right. The Pac-12 would still be in, you know, there's a few different reasons the Pac-12 would still be in place. You know, right. two different commissioners completely botched that whole thing, but if they had ever had any wording in place like the ACC has with theirs, it would still be around. And I completely agree with what you're saying. I just, I'm sorry, Clemson. I'm sorry, Florida State. I don't feel for any of you. You took the no. money when it appeared that the money exactly. was good. Bingo. And now the only reason you're complaining is because all these other schools. Now, I'd probably be mad, too, if I was Clemson and I saw Indiana Purdue and Purdue and Rutgers, you know, getting the size paychecks that they're getting. But. That's it is the, what it is, man. And here's uh, yeah. here's what they said about Notre Dame in there. Clemson's lawsuit argues the ACC withdrawal fee does not represent actual damages because Notre Dame has the same fee despite having its own separate football TV deal with NBC. In other words, Notre Dame would have to pay the same amount that any other ACC member, you know, pays in, you know, in their separation deal they would have to pay the same amount of money to the ACC to get out of that contract but Notre Dame obviously doesn't have the same revenue or you know they don't have they don't the, same the same TV amount. contract yeah, right. basically but you know like from the Notre Dame perspective as we know Notre Dame is actually getting obviously less in that NBC now the one you know between the getting the new contract and you know what they're still going to continue to get from the ACC it's it's fairly similar but Notre Dame for, you know, just even as of right now and through the end of this season is actually getting less than those ACC schools when it's right. all said and done. But they have to pay that same, you know, break contract grant of rights fee. Yeah, I don't see how bringing up Notre Dame helps Clemson's. Uh, no, argument. I don't either. I really don't. I think it hurts their argument, actually, when it's all said and done. I mean, Notre Dame's not a full member of the ACC, and yet they do the things that the ACC wants them to do, and they – allow their, you know, uh, their road games to be televised on their networks and, you know, all of these different things. And they agreed to have to pay this hefty amount to get out of it. Right. Like, I don't think it's making the argument they think it's making. I don't you either. Know? You know I don't I mean? either. And, you know, like you said, they sound like children. To me, it's like, remember Demi Moore's character and A Few Good Men when they're in court? And it's like, I object. No, I really object. I strenuously object. object, you know, it's like you right. can, you can call it what you want and you can uh -huh. change the wording, but it just doesn't matter. I just, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see if a court agrees with them on any of this, but it, it just seems like, as we've said before, for probably the last year now at this point, Vince, if there was any way 
these ACC schools could get out of this contract, I think they would already be out of it and oh, in yeah. another conference. 100%. 100% because they know that the grass is greener from a financial right. standpoint and they would have been gone. And we know the SEC would love to take Clemson and and Florida State for that matter. I mean, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get into the SEC, right? And so I, I just – I think it's hilarious, frankly. It's like, oh, it's just not good enough. I want out. Like, no. no. Like, you agreed to this. This is on you. You know, 2036. No. See, I did, I'm sorry. I disagree with this, TD. We, he says when the majority of teams in no. the conference want to leave, it will implode. I mean, I think the majority probably want to leave. One, there's no place for them. The SEC doesn't want – most of them. And two, they're all held together because to be. of this contract. They would all still have to pay the fee. I mean, that's right. what's holding this thing together yes. is the hefty grant of rights, you know, you know, breaking the contract fee that they would have to pay to get out. It doesn't matter how many want out. Yeah. It's can you legally get out without it costing you an arm and leg? And that's what's holding it all together. It's just going to cost too much for any of them to get out. That's right. what it is. And now Clemson and Florida State are going to spend all kinds of money on legal fees and everything else to try to make this happen. And I mean, if they're going to follow the law, the law is going to say, sorry, you're stuck is basically yeah. what it, what it's going to say. Now, could there be a crooked judge out there that's going to change it or whatever? Then, <laughs> yeah, that's possible. But yeah. at the end of the day, they, but, they signed a contract. You know, the other side of this is, yeah, and this is what I was just going to get to, Josh. He said, I heard the SEC doesn't really want FSU. And I don't think there's that much desire for Clemson either because neither <laughs> one of them, neither one of them, you know, Florida State is a little bit more of a, you know, long-term, you know, brand name, I guess, in college football, even though they've obviously had, you know, this recent stretch where they were not very good. They just came, like, where Clemson has been better lately but neither one of them is in a in a big media market and the SEC already has you know the University of Florida in Florida so they've got Florida for basically the Florida media markets the ACC has Miami you know like uh, I guess you can't really use that as an example but my point is like the, the SEC doesn't need Clemson even other than for you know sort of for what they are right now Wh who's Who's to say that they're not just a flash in the pan? What big, you know, in the, in a macro sense, what does Clemson give the SEC 10 years from now when Dabo Sweeney potentially is gone? And I mean, with every season, Dabo Sweeney, I think, is starting to creep, yeah, closer. I don't want to say hot seat just yet, but he's he's creeping closer to a place where he's yeah, he's in he's in a prove it stage again because of the philosophy he's taken with the transfer portal and everything else. So I guess my point is Clemson is not a big enough brand. They don't give good or, you know, they, they're, they're, they're not incentive enough from a media market standpoint. Like what, what purpose do, does either one of those really serve the SEC right. or, and really what purpose, I guess maybe you could argue the big 10 just because it helps, you know, it, it would help the big 10's footprint, but at, you know, at one point, I don't know. We're, we're all creeping. We're, you know, it, it's all creeping for you towards a place that I don't think we really want. But I my agree. point is, I just, I don't see, I don't see either one of them being as desirable as I think they are. Right. Well, and this is, this is a, a question that I wanted to bring out. Rabid Nile Chihuahua, great name, by the way. If they all decided to leave, who's left to pay the fee to? Isn't the ACC made up of those colleges or it's something layered on top of the colleges? The problem was if they just all decided that we, we're not going to be in the ACC anymore. Well, they couldn't play on TV anymore. Right. And because that's part of the deal too. You can't, the, yeah. you can't go get your own. Like if, if they were to leave and join another conference, whatever TV revenue they were getting, you know, if they just decided they were going to do it would go to the ACC. So whether there are schools, you know, remaining in the ACC, just like right now, the PAC 12 remains an entity, even though there are just two teams, there's a new commissioner, of the Pac-12, even though there are far from 12 teams out there, the ACC remains an entity and they have signed contracts with all of these yep. other entities that are in their little fiefdom known as the ACC. So if they, if they leave, even though they might technically not be in the ACC, they still owe the ACC money. 
in in accordance with the contracts that they have right. at the conference. Right. So they can't just say, "Oh, we're not in the ACC anymore." Right. That just it wouldn't work. Like you, you wouldn't be able to take in money for another conference. Right. And so, and I yeah. think that I think I think that that's you know again that's part of it as well. You know, like say say Clemson would just say, "Well, forget it. We're going to go join the the SEC," and that's assuming uh, again that the SEC would want Clemson. So now the SEC, you know, so now Clemson is in the SEC. They're not, according to that contract, they're not allowed to, you know, basically take money from the SEC and they can't be on TV until after 2036, according to the contract, if they break the contract. Yeah. I mean, it is what it is, you know, that's why contracts were made. And if you don't want to be subject to a contract, then don't sign it. Right. That's that's and and for that matter, you know, be, because of the fact that the ACC has the TV contract with ESPN and everything, you know, there there are other layers there. You know, just in terms of would ESPN even be, you know, allowed to televise any games that involve Clemson because of the fact that you you know had those contracts right. in place. There's again, that's that's for all the lawyers and everything to settle out to 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 figure out, but at uh, I just have to believe that if it were possible for any of these ACC schools oh. to leave, they already would have left. Yes. That's because we're years, di- we're, we're what? We're going, are we going on three years since USC and UCLA or is it just two years? Gosh, I think it's two. Summer? I think it's two. It all blends together. So yeah, <laughs> I think I it's two years. It's yeah, it's three years since Texas and Oklahoma that we're yes. coming up on two years yes. since USC and UCLA. They obviously all jump quickly, but again, their conferences didn't have like there were grant of rights contracts, but they weren't, you know, the same as what the ACC has. I think think because mostly because of the length of the ACC's contract, like Texas and Oklahoma, I believe, had to pay a little money to get out earlier than they would have. But it was nowhere near like, you know, hundred and, you know, 30 some million dollars that it would cost an ACC school to get out at this point because it's x amount for each year remaining on the contract right yeah so, so then the number goes down the closer you get to it right but they're just so far away from the end that, that it's the number's astronomical which was what makes it prohibitive yeah and, that's exactly and what, right and what makes the acc genius frankly whoever wrote the contract okay was really smart about it i'll just say that these these people are are tied to this thing well and remember you know again even if the SEC and the Big Ten wanted either one of these schools, remember when the whole thing w- with Oregon and Washington and where you know was the Big Ten going to let them in? There was like you know Fox had to come back and say, well, you know, well, like basically, when you add schools, it cuts down the annual payout yep. that yep. each school that's already in there has. And so you got to go to the TV and ask them to rip right. it up and so, start so over. The TV partner has yeah. to give you more money for equal shares or everyone's going to have to take less money right. to let them in. Which isn't again, that what's I happening it, in the Big Ten? Like those guys, those, right. those new teams coming in are taking a fraction right. of what the current teams are taking. Right. Yeah. And like in SMU's case, they obviously agreed to take virtually no money for a long time to join the ACC. And, you know, they're, I think the Stanford and Cal Remember, they're going to get less money for being in the ACC for a while, you know. So it's like it's it's just again, if it was just as simple as saying I want out, I just have to think that they would already be out. But I think that there are so many layers to it that that's obviously right. why Clemson feels like they're forced to this place. But I just I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a lawyer, so again, I'll let them figure it out. But I just don't see them being able to get out anytime I soon. Either. I don't either. Okay, scale of one to ten. What chance do you give the Notre Dame women to reach the Sweet Sixteen for a third straight year? Twelve. <laughs> I know. I, I really. I think that they're going to do. Uh, I think they're going to take care of business, especially being at home. I think uh, the fans are going to come out. They're going to be behind the Irish, and uh, I just. I don't see. I just don't see a world in which Notre Dame doesn't make it to the Sweet Sixteen. I'll give it a nine. Uh, I will just say, like looking at Ole Miss. Assuming Ole Miss gets past Marquette, it it should be a good matchup. But like that Ole Miss team has got some athleticism. They, they they're they're they look at they are and they are deep as well. I was like looking at this roster and it's like really I've got it. Like when I make my sheets, like 
there's a they play a lot of players. Okay. Uh, they you know they're they're fairly athletic, you know. So I'm gonna give the the one chance to Ole Miss okay. if Ole Miss gets past Marquette. I think that, that that should be a good matchup, you know. And again, when you look at, at Notre Dame's depth, how much does that become an issue potentially if it is a matchup with a if very deep Ole Miss team? If they're so, running, yeah. But I'll give them a nine. I, I, I'm going nine to the Sweet 16. Well, because of all the uh, the ties that you gave about Marquette, Notre Dame, and everything, <laughs> I picked Marquette to beat Ole Miss. That was my oh, one. Up, okay. That was my one upset, uh, or one. Okay. Up, I, yeah, not many upsets in the women's uh, tournament, especially the first couple rounds. Very that true. was one of them because I, I I'd love to see that matchup. I think that would be fun. Okay, I, I can't disagree with that. What chance do you give? Again, scale of one to ten. What chance do you give the Irish women to make it to the Elite Eight? For the first time since 2019, obviously tougher. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it back a little bit. I'm gonna give them like a seven, like a six and a half, seven. That's kind of where I'm at. I think they got a really good shot of getting to the elite eight. I, I like the matchup, the potential matchups uh, that they have there, and so I, I think that they're gonna make it to the elite eight. So I, I give them a better than average number, six and a half, yeah. seven. John is like through the roof on on all of this. John is like very confident. Yep, he's going, he's going ten to the elite eight. TD four ND says seven. Michael Johnson says seven. I'm going eight nice. to the elite eight again. Now, assuming the matchup is Oregon State, just looking ahead at at, at okay. them a little bit, like they don't have near the depth. It, it looks like they've got a a really good post player, and other than that, mm, kind of some. They're okay. a little bit of the unknown, just like the Pac-12 always is. You know, a little bit of the unknown. I was a little surprised that Oregon State kind of snuck in there with that number three seed, but uh, feel really good about a potential Notre Dame matchup with the Beavers, though. I so like it. I give it an eight. Their chances to get to the Elite. Okay. Eight. So All now, right. if they get to the one. Elite Eight, scale of one to ten, what chance do you give them to make it to the Final Four? This is obviously where it takes a little bit of a hit. I am not saying it's impossible because they would play in South Carolina potentially, right. assuming they're not knocked off. So that would be a zero if I was giving them no chance at all. So I'm going to give them a three. Okay. I think, I think I, I'm saying there's a chance. I think they could do it and it wouldn't be a complete shocker if they did it. So I'm giving them a, I'm giving them a three trying to be realistic here. So South Carolina is so good. You know, if, if, if now if South Carolina gets bumped off, I bump it up to like a seven because I think Notre Dame has the ability to beat just about anybody in the country with the way they're playing right now. South Carolina is just a different beast. So yeah, if it's South Carolina, I give them a three. If it's anybody else, I, I bump it up to like a six or a seven. Yeah, and that's I'm I'll go I'm going five. I'll give them fifty nice. fifty. I love you it, know, man. But, I'm usually the homer. I love it. <laughs> it's. South Carolina is a better three-point shooting team this year than they were last year. And you add that with Cardoso, their, you know, their big center in there. You know, she is so physical. And that yeah. that That's really awesome. is the difference. You know, the fact that they're able to play inside out the way they are yeah. this year. And I think that that's – but I also look at the fact this would be a rematch, obviously. They open the season against each other. So Notre Dame at least has some familiarity with it, you know, it, it would go the other way for South Carolina. You know, the the numbers thing could come into play. How physical can you play with Cardoso? I think is what it would come down to. If I'm just breaking down the matchup right now, and that you know, it's going to be a tough task. But I'll give them a 50 50 if they could, because odds are you're going to see Notre Dame play. You know, zone probably 70 to 80 percent of the time. You know, because of the way the roster is configured right now. You know, so what. So what kind of effect does that have? You know, is the other team, any of these teams that we're talking about, is the other team making threes? Do you, you know, do you make Notre Dame come out of the zone and that kind of thing? Yeah. What do the fouls look like? But then the other thing is if Notre Dame, if Notre Dame defends and and gets that transition game going, that's when they get uh, get a little bit scary, you know, and that's that's how they were able to have some success at the ACC tournament. So I'll give them I'll give them 50 50 chance punchers. I like chance it, man. I South love Carolina it. If they get to the elite. Eight. Hey, I'll be rooting hard. There's no doubt about that. I mean, I would love to see Notre Dame return, uh, you know, to the to the final four. And and I know 
I know our buddy Jesse would love for them to return to the Final Four because it's in Cleveland, in and, his backyard, uh, baby. I mean, he can he can really he can uh, dust off that press pass and uh, go check out the <laughs> Final Four. That's right. That's exactly See? right. Yes. <laughs> All right, so back over in the men's tournament, fill in the blank. After UConn, San Diego State, and Florida Atlantic all made the men's Final Four last year, it's blank. They are all in the same region this year. I mean, it is, uh, I guess, a luck of the draw, I guess is the best way to put it, or unluck of the draw, depending on how you want to look at it. I, I It's uh, just kind of the way it works out i i wouldn't say that they did that on purpose i think you know each year is unique to itself but uh it's still very interesting that they're all in the same you know region and and you, you might have yukon and florida atlantic playing in the second round <laughs> you know that's after, a good point you know so it's uh it, it's crazy the way it it worked out you know it uh it stinks for florida atlantic but i i agree i i don't think they did this necessarily intentionally i know a lot of people are crying about it a lot of people crying about oh yukon's got the <laughs> toughest draw and all that stuff look yukon's the defending national champion and yeah. if they are that good if they're as good as everybody says then it shouldn't matter you know just because san diego state and florida atlantic made it to the final four last year doesn't like make them any better this year than they were last year they wouldn't be eight and five seeds you know if if they were, you know, and then if they weren't eight and five seeds, they might be right in, uh, in different regions. Exactly. You know? So it's you, you, you don't necessarily see all three teams in the same region right off the bat the next year. But it's it's not like you haven't seen this kind of thing happen before where you've at least got a couple of teams that were in the final four one year and end up, you know, playing relatively early. The next year it just it happens sometimes yeah and it, and we're not talking about blue bloods here either you know what i mean yeah, like exactly I, the, the couple of these teams were you know upstarts and and cinderellas or whatever term you want to use right and so it's not like kansas and yukon for example you know what i mean right. and they, they were in the final four now they're in the same region or whatever you know it, i think it's because you had the upsets and the, the craziness of the tournament the way it went down last year I mean, you could have just shaken up a lot of those teams and then just yahtzee them into a region. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like, I, I just think it's a, a very large coincidence. Yeah. I agree. I completely agree with that last part. So Caleb Williams finished his two years at USC with 210 carries for 518 rushing yards. Vince's favorite guy. If you take away the 63 times he was sacked in the two years at USC, he would have 147 carries for 997 yards and a 6.8 yards per carry average. Now, I saw – I'll see if I can find who tweeted, like, this stuff out. But do you okay. buy or sell – when you look at that, do you buy or sell doing away with sacks counting against a quarterback's rushing totals in college? It's a huge buy. This is this is long, long overdue. Uh, you know, it, it to me, on, honestly, it's like akin to the NCAA finally counting sack numbers. You know what I mean? Like, right. What are we right. waiting for? OK, I, th this is stupid. Your rushing total should have nothing to do with sacks. Nothing to do with sacks. I agree. That should, that should be a team stat. And it really kind of hinders, you know, when you're looking at a mobile quarterback and what he's able to do with his legs. I mean, the the. Case in point right here, right? And and I wonder, you know, for example, let's 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 crank it back to like a Notre Dame thing. I wonder what it would look like if you did this for Riley Leonard. You know, what would his rushing stats look sure. like if you took away sacks? Any any mobile quarterback, Ian Book, for example, or Deshaun Kaiser when he would run the ball all over the place, right? What would that look like? This is long overdue. This is ridiculous. I can't believe that they're still doing it this way. This is a huge buy for me. It's a buy for me as well, uh, and I am not shocked that John wants to sell this. TD4ND <laughs> wants to sell it as well. Wow! Take take Caleb Williams out of this, right? You right. Know, like he was just the one used as as an example. Well, you know, we're not changing the rule because of Caleb Williams, but you know, look at the fact that basically you add like what four hundred and eighty, almost five hundred more yards to his rushing total if you take out sacks. It's not done in the NFL. These are not rushing attempts. You know, they, right, they are exactly sacked. If they exactly. are actual rushing attempts, 
you know, then that's, that's different. And, you know, like maybe it's because it's easier for, you know, statisticians in college where it's like, Weak. Oh, the guys drop behind the line. It's an automatic rush attempt. You don't have to separate. We, you know, I don't, I don't know, <laughs> but I, it just, it has never made sense to me because right. it's, it's, it was not the intent of the quarterback for that to be a rushing attempt. He was dropping back to pass and the defense sacked him. It, it should not count against his rushing totals. And I think it would give everyone a much more clear picture. And not only that, like it's going to, you know, it's going to boost <laughs> the team's rushing totals at the end of the season as well. It's going to look a lot different That's true. if you take the adjustment for sacks out of there. So I, I buy it as well. I think it's, it's ridiculous that they've continued to keep this. I have no idea why they've actually kept this, you know, like, uh, I guess the other side of that is to go back on what I just said, you could easily make it like a team rush, but not count against the quarterback. You know, if you wanted yeah. to do that, if you still wanted to, you know, to count those yards against the team's total, but not the quarterback's total, because again, if you're crediting a sack, then you shouldn't also be, you know, counting against the rushing totals in the end. Agreed. I mean, I absolutely agree. Father David, uh, you know, he's got to, got to, throw in his two cents here. And I, I love it. I think this is a great clarifier. He says, what would you do if the quarterback is scrambling around and gets sacked? Well, I think that's a sack. So that would not count against his rushing totals because it's meant to be, if it's meant to be a pass right, and you get sacked, then it doesn't count against you. Now, if it's meant to be a pass and you scramble and you gain yards, then obviously you can gain right. those yards. In, like in the NFL, once once the quarterback commits toward running forward, as soon as he takes a step, like he's his intent is running right. forward. Again, you're putting some some yeah. sort of onus, you know, and responsibility on the statisticians or whatever for. But look, coaches go back and change stats after the games all the time. But I agree. If a, if a, basically it's as simple as if a sack is credited, then it doesn't count. But if it's not credited as a sack then it's different. And then it counts as a rut, you know, as, as an official rushing attempt. And again, the NFL does this guys. Like this is not some foreign concept. Right. This, this is how the NFL operates. And so if the NFL can do it. Then the, then the NCAA should be able to figure it out too. Michael says, if sacks are counting as a rush, then pass interference yards should count against passing yards. I'm double whammy. Yeah. That's fine. I get it. Yeah. That's it. No. Oh, okay. That's all we got. <laughs> that's all we've got for tonight. That's right. Hey, that's okay. Oh, got a little corned beef and cabbage going on upstairs. Oh, nice. Today. A little late St. Patrick's Day meal. I'm, not, I'm just not sure how I feel. I've always avoided it, but now it's been made by my wife. So I will be eating it. Um, we're going to see, we're going to see the verdict is out. We're going to, we're going to have to see. Okay. So this bracket challenge, remember oh, we've yeah. got, we've got men's and women's bracket challenges going at ESPN.com. So like you go to the men's bracket or the women's bracket, if you want to get in the group, what is it? Is it IB nation sports talk? Is that the yep, group? That's name? the name of the group. IB nation sports talk, just how it, it's listed right down there. Right. IB Nation Sports Talk, you just search for the group. You can join it. It's a public group, but there is a passcode, and the passcode is Irish Breakdown. It's all one word, and I and B are capitalized. Easy. Right. And so there's been plenty of people that have figured it out, obviously. We've got 11 in the women's side of things, it looks like. And on the men's side, we are sitting at 58. So obviously more interest in the men's. Not surprising, but just more of a chance for me to win the women's one. So that's where we're at. So join both. It'll be fun. Yep. TD4ND wants to know what the prize is. You get to be the holder on a field goal attempts for Dylan D'Addario <laughs> when Vince D'Addario snaps to you. <laughs> that's first prize. That's awesome. <laughs> that would be fun. If you're a local, we can make that one happen for sure. That's right. <laughs> we can definitely make that happen. <laughs> there is no official prize as of right now. I don't know if we're going to get one. We're just, you know, we're kind of doing it for the fun, bragging yeah. rights, that kind of thing. Um, but I don't know. Maybe we can coax a prize out of somebody when it's all said and done. We'll see. 
We'll see. We're not gonna make we any kinda, promises. We just get Vince and I were talking yesterday. We were in text chain and we were just like, yeah, let's just do it. You know, we'll have yeah. fun with it. What the heck? Hey, 60 of our friends are doing it with us. So I love it. It'll be fun. There you go. As I predicted, though, there's there's always more interest in the men's bracket than there is the women. You know, like like I said, like the women's women's game is is gaining more, you know, like star players. I think that there's a lot of actual TV interest in certain players in certain games. Sure. The men, like the bracket is always the thing. Everyone, everyone wants to fill out the men's bracket. That's yeah, that's the biggest draw, I think, for the interest it in is. the men's tournament. Yep. No, it totally is. And that's cool. Hey, I get it, man. I've been filling out men's brackets since it's old enough to watch, you know, with any kind of interest. You know, I remember doing it in high school. So here we go. It'd be fun. Yep. We've got a couple different things going on over the next couple of days. We've got a Notre Dame practice to go to tomorrow. We'll get to talk to the two line coaches and a handful of players right. afterwards. So we'll kind of have some uh, some thoughts right. from practice, practice and a mailbag shows. tomorrow night as well. So practice resumes tomorrow. That's right. Here Spring we go. Practice is back. And then we got pro day That's on right. Thursday. See how the 40 times look. You're going to be Mr. Busy. What else is new? <laughs> You're not wrong. And then we got basketball this weekend. Yes. Looking forward to it. It's March, baby. It's already March 19th. That's the thing. March is almost over. I know. Isn't that nuts? A week from now, March is practically over. It's going to be great because so. that means spring break for Vince. Fired up, baby. Good luck. All right. That's going to do it for tonight. Thanks to Ryan earlier tonight. Thanks to Vince as well. I'm Sean. Hit the like button before you leave, please. And, of course, subscribe, rate, and review. And we'll talk to you tomorrow on Aviation Sports Talk.